Today, I had the great pleasure to speak with Dr. Scott Walter, who is a factory and robotics simulation expert and who is a regular guest on the channel at this point, and also Gary Schneider, who is a biomedical engineer at the University of Colorado at Denver, where he helps doctors make better clinical decisions through data profiling on patients. Gary is also owner of Train Station LLC, or with an AI in the middle, which uses machine learning algorithms to enhance human performance from wellness to extreme physiology, including studying the effects of space travel on humans to design countermeasure systems. In this discussion, we really get into it about TeslaBot. We talk a lot about its design, its hardware, but even more so about the software, the vision systems, and especially the training that goes on in TeslaBot to make it such a potentially groundbreaking and world-changing invention. Let's take a look. Hey, y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I am joined by not one, but two robotics experts this evening. Dr. Scott Walter, who is a factory and robotics simulation expert in particular, and also Gary Schneider, who is a biomedical engineer at the University of Colorado at Denver. So thank you both for being here. What an amazing privilege it's going to be to be able to talk to you. We're going to talk mostly about TeslaBot and the new amazing things that we learned during AI Day, the little secrets. Uh, I think, Scott, you had said previously it was like a burlesque where they tease you with all this stuff but never show you the mm -hmm. goods you know so it was sort of like that so we're going to try to tease out what things we could figure out that go perhaps beyond the obvious things that they presented but first of all you two have a story to tell about how you met so i'm going to let i guess i'll let gary start telling the story yeah so uh i mean i had the pleasure of meeting scott totally randomly uh, actually at Kennedy Space Center. So I was down in Florida doing uh, some uh, training with Project Possum. It's a scientist astronaut candidate training where we kind of go through some of the basics of what uh, an astronaut might be experiencing through the training process, everything from G-force training to hyperbaric training and things like that. And we, on the last day, we had a chance to tour uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, of course, I'm walking around my favorite rocket of all time, which is Saturn V. That's the massive Saturn V and just soaking it in and trying to take up the engines and and kind of just, uh, you know, envision myself maybe in it and, and was having the time of my life already. And out of the corner of my ear, I hear someone talking about the rocket equation, breaking down specific impulse. And, you know, uh, you know as it was fluid, the acceleration picks up. And I'm like, yeah, someone really knows what they're talking about over there. I need to kind of just see what's going on. And so there's a guy wearing, a, you know, a lanyard and a, a SpaceX hat and looks pretty official. And I'm thinking, this has got to be a tour guide. This is, has to be a Kennedy Space Center tour guide, the way he's talking about the rocket. So maybe I can sneak in and get a free tour out of this and kind of squeeze in on this lady's tour a little bit. And uh, sure enough, it just happens to be this, this uh, incredibly intelligent rocket scientist slash roboticist. And I'm like, hey, are you giving a tour here? He's like, no, I just love, love, uh, love the rockets. And uh, he was kind enough to let me sit in on his explanation to Ellie in space. Um, and kind of one thing led to another. Uh, introduced him to a few of my crewmates, as well as Ellie to uh, Sarah Saber, who's an astronaut from the Blue Origin um, uh, missions. Uh, actually, the New Shepard uh, launched just this last summer. Uh, and we kind of just hit it off and uh, ended up going to TGI Fridays that night to just kind of talk rockets and robots and whatever else. And it turned into a four hour or so conversation we, until we like closed the joint. Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we sure. closed the joint. And I uh, ended up just You should have gone hours. to Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never yeah, would have had to leave. Down. You could have just right. stayed there forever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next uh, time. Next time. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Well, so pretty amazing. It's a, it, this just goes to show, keep your ears open and your eyes open, and it's a small Always. world. I <laughs> really, I actually really want to find out about your whole, just give me a little history of you with the uh, Possum program and NASA. I mean, you're wearing your NASA shirt yeah. or, or jacket, so that's really cool. I'm super impressed. I ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. So now I'm like, wow, I get to meet a yeah. real live one. So there you go. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm not affiliated with NASA. This is just from my tours to the space centers. Um, that is like more of a long-term goal and what I'm uh, working towards. Uh, I've got a little bit of time to finish more degrees and uh, start that process. Project Possum is great because it's, it's a civilian program. So uh, a lot of my hope to get started even before I start the NASA process is see if there's some opportunities within the uh, commercial space. I mean, with the amount of work that Alana has done in, in pioneering the way for human space flight commercially, uh, I mean, there's opportunities now from SpaceX and Blue Origin and uh, uh, Virgin as well. So uh, Possum is basically preparing people for uh, scientific research in suborbital environments, more specifically measuring uh, and observing noctilucent cloud formations uh, using the Spaceship 2. So a, a lot of our training was in a Spaceship 2 module 
and wearing the IVA suit and basically performing some the scientific tests, both in situ uh, and, and remote sensed uh, in the simulator, uh, along with a pilot and just getting used to, you know, what does that parabolic flight look like? What are the things you'll experience during the parabolic flight? And what are the scientific operations research methods that will go into doing research out of that spacecraft? Uh, right. And then eventually be uh, in the pool of candidates to be selected by uh, Project Possum to do some of that scientific research. So I'm not an atmospheric scientist myself. It was my first time getting a lot of uh, experience under some of these new, uh, you know, scientific categories. I I'm a physiologist by trade. Um, but, uh, you know, getting the training and, and maybe preparing to be more of a crew physiologist is, is uh, what I'm hoping for for mission specialty. That's that's really astounding. That's so cool. And as it as it turns out, the whole thing about simulations is definitely going to tie into the topic of the oh, yeah. of the evening. Yeah, we're definitely going to do that. <laughs> Automated right. lights here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to keep moving around. You can't stay still. I, yeah, I always I'll know just I, do this the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, like, I used to work in a computer lab when I was a grad student that had the automated lights and. Yep. I realized that I had been sitting there too long when the lights would turn out on me, you know, because I'm like, if I'd been focused and typing and coding and all of a sudden the lights go bang and I'm like, oh, crap, I got to get up yep. and like do this. Yeah. So yep. there you go. And, and so we're, if, we're nested if, in a... Obviously, we're nested in a hospital, so we're the only room that has the auto lights, really. It's, so people walk in and they're like, you guys just like the dark why are you guys always sitting in the dark while you're coding and stuff it's like, well it's kind of peaceful <laughs> yeah, there you go that's the way it goes so anyway if you disappear on us once in a while we'll understand that you just yeah. have to wave your arms a little bit so yeah. all right so uh yeah where do we want to begin with this whole thing do we want to start with um i i don't know what the actuators well, with the, the overall the, picture mm -hmm. i yeah where do you want to start there was kind of one topic that I, I think we'd like to cover that has been coming up when I, I've seen a lot of people replying to some of our tweets wanting to know how the, the robot itself is going to be taught and some of the different capabilities. Right. Um, the other thing that sort of started this is that um, I'll just share my screen here for a second of sort of a tweet thread uh, that uh, <clears throat> began over here. Um, and. It came when uh, when John tweeted out the fact that the ultrasonics are going to go. And then when right. I saw that, oh, they're, they're taking them off. That means this whole discussion about adding more sensors to the hand. I just said, oh, that settles it. There's not going to be any <laughs> new additional ones. <laughs> right. And, right. and Scaro Charo and I, we, we, we've had like a, a lot of conversations back and forth on Twitter that have really been good. He's, he's, he's always kind of... Um, you know, making good points that I have to think about. And then I, it just kind of goes along pretty well. So really, you know, my hat's off to him. I really like right. interacting. And so there was kind of a lot of questions. And then uh, it went on down to this and this, and then and then a question. And then finally, I said, okay, Dr. Know-it-all and I should do one, an episode. So right. Right. getting myself in trouble that already <laughs> I was like scheduling you for an episode <laughs> and this was his reaction. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. So now he can get excited. At least we'll have one so, of your so now, So there yes, we know. We got to get excited. So um, pretty much what um, I was talking about at this point, and it's probably going to go into the, the, the general discussion of how do we go ahead and um, you know teach the robot in general and, and what is the hand doing? And so right. you know, one of the questions is, is the hand is going to close down on something and how does it know whether it's hard or squishy or, or, or something like that? And I've been saying that, again, that don't worry about whether it can grab an egg or not, because have you seen any eggs on the automotive assembly line? Don't <laughs> right. so, so really don't worry about it. It's yeah. not going to be there. But at the same time, I was like, well, how is it going to tell the difference between, you know, if, if it's a Nerf ball or a baseball or something like that and begin to think about it a little bit? Well, there's a couple of things that, you know, when the hand closes down, it works the same way as the hatch in your Model Y. So there's a certain torque profile that it is expecting, and it goes down. And as soon as it runs into some sort of obstruction, suddenly the current goes up, and it goes out of spec. And it's like, whoa, right. I've got to stop. And then it retracts. So there is no sensor in the Model Y that is like looking to see if something is bumping. And it's just that suddenly it realizes, hey, I'm pushing harder than I want, and it reacts back. And you have the same thing if something is very hard that you're going to you're going to come up against and you're going to get a current spike, which is much sharper, as opposed to something which is soft, like if it's a nerf, it's going to have a, a different profile, something like that. And I was thinking even further, it's like, you know, if you've got a camera and I've got a couple of balls in front of me, I can look at it and say, oh, that's a baseball. And if I need to grab it, I know I'm going to need a certain grip profile. And I can also look at it and say, right. oh, that looks like a nerf ball. I'm going to require something different. Right. And so it's making me think that. There's going to be a lot of things out there. It's already going to have a profile because we innately do. I mean, I know right. that this is a plastic bottle when I look at it as opposed to a glass bottle. So I, I kind of already know 
how much force and pressure you have to put on there. So right. I think it's a lot more that we can start doing with cameras and then start taking it into how are they actually going to say, all right, I want you to do this particular task. And there's been a lot of things like, oh, is someone going to put on some kind of suit? Is there going to be a VR suit or, or some other kind of motion capture suit where they kind of go in and start moving the robot around and showing it like that? Or is it going to be like I was saying more of, of a sensei where you have the robot next to a person and then he's looking at that person and studying their motions and then saying, oh, I'll go ahead and kind of duplicate something like that. And there's probably going to be mixtures of that all, all along. But I think at some point it's going to be really simple. And this is where right. I just kind of want to lay the groundwork. Now, I've been I was quiet for like five minutes there while you guys were talking. <laughs> it's like the quiet as I've ever been in a long time. So we're going to lay it out. <laughs> so let's get ready here. Is I, I want to use an analogy that I think everyone can relate to, because I, I was talking before about how we teach robots normally. And that maybe if no one's really seen the industrial robot a little bit hard to maybe understand. So I want you to imagine this scenario that you're like the only occupant in your town. Okay. And you have a car and you are able to drive it around the town and you don't have to worry about any other cars or pedestrians or anything like that. And suddenly right. someday you say, Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to come with some kind of recording device in my car. That's going to record every single thing I do in the car, you know, any sort of gear change, any pedal application, any tugs on the, on the steering wheel, and it's we're going to record that, and it's going to faithfully return that back to the car. And so that means so long as I start my car in the same location every morning, and I push the button and say, do this recording that's going to take me to the library, it's just going to do all those things and get there. Don't mind the fact that, like, you know, with tire wear and everything else, it's eventually going right. to, like, not be <laughs> right. as accurate. But the idea is, is that's what we call lead through teach kind of playback. Where you, it's an online teaching, you're really teaching every single step that's going on. And it has no concept, the fact that it stopped at a stop sign. All it knows is that it kind of drove for a while, the brakes were applied, <laughs> right. and you stayed there for 10 seconds before suddenly hitting the accelerator. Right. So that gets you there. And then if you then decide, oh, I want to go you know, to another location now. So I, I want to go to the park instead. You have to then teach the whole thing all over again. But you might realize, right. but you know what? Halfway there, it's about the same thing. So you might run the other program, and then when you kind of get to a fork, where you know we're going to go a different direction, you just kind of like say, okay, copy the program here, delete the rest of it, and then let's right. just put on some right. And you keep on doing that again and again, and that's what we call online teaching. Now you might start to get clever and say, you know what? I don't feel like taking the car for all these drives. I'm going to create a really good 3D world of my town. And I'm going to have a car simulator and the car is going to drive in the simulator like the real one. Right. And I go through and I drive that and I record everything from that. And hopefully I think can take that recording and either I have to apply some magic parameters or a few other things or, or directly <laughs> goes in there. And now the car will work. Now that's what we call in robotics offline programming. So you, you take the, the virtual robot, you teach the whole thing, you go ahead and do that. But there's still like a lot of teaching that's going on in there. And you can do these clever editing where you can do like copy and paste and a little bit of modification, but there's still a lot of effort that goes into that. But right now, you know, it's it's a mar remarkable what we can do. And this is what right. I've always wanted to be able to do with industrial robot is when you program your car right now, and we are doing this today, your program is just give the destination. You don't do right. anything else. You just right. say, destination and it breaks it down so it breaks it down to a bunch you know first it does a star to find the route then it breaks right. it down into a bunch of goals and some sub goals and some sub tasks and it just keeps on driving it until it reaches an intersection and then has some sort of decision and implements some other kind of functionality and goes on and that is just absolutely amazing and i think eventually it's going to be like that with optimus so what will happen with optimus is that someone's going to say i want you to load widget a into the um the widget a machine and that's it it'll just do yeah. it now so how it's going to do well the first thing it's going to do is it's going to realize i'm nowhere near where the, the the widget a machine is so it's going to have a factory map it's going to kind of know and it's going to navigate itself over there and it's going to kind of know where to go because when i say you know go to john's house a lot right. of times, if you tell someone to go to John's house, it means go to his front door. It doesn't mean go to the mailbox or something like that. You usually know that. 
And if I'm going to be more explicit about it, I might say, yeah, go to John's house, but go to the side door. So right. usually any of these things that it knows the destination is going to not be kind of in the vicinity that I recognize it, but it's going to know. And it will then be able to kind of take instructions and it'll just get itself there and say, oh, now the next thing I need to do is like, I was told I have to load widget A. Well, right. what is widget A? Well, it, it has a database of all the parts in the factory. And so it's going to look around and say, whoa, you know, where's widget A? Do I see any widget A's over here? And if they're not there, then it's going to call the MES system and say, <clears throat> bring them on over. You forgot to dump <laughs> right. them off. But it's going to look over and say, oh, there's a tray full of widget A parts over here. And now I need to load them in. And now the question is, is it a very simple type of thing that it can figure it out? Because in my house on Christmas, whenever we get anything, we opened it up and we assembled it. And then as like, my father right, right. always said, the instructions were just there to make sure you put it together right. right? <laughs> right. So <laughs> the whole challenge was that, you know, you should be able to figure this thing out. And if it's really clever, you would probably look at it and realize that, oh, this thing kind of fits in that fixture over there. And that makes sense. Or it might be the kind of thing, this is a complex assembly task. I need to bring up something. And you know, there's already these AR applications to show operators how something works, where they can put on the goggles and it shows you these are the steps, repair steps or something like that. So like, bring that up. And then it's going to see, oh, these are the orders of operations. It's going to look around, it's going to find anything. But if it's really simple, it's going to look at that, pick it up, figure out how to put it on in there. Then it may realize I've got a tray of things. I've got to go through them sequentially. And I probably have to hit the start button every time, make sure it goes into the machine, wait for the next location. And it's going to start doing that and doing that and doing that. And it's going to be calling up, you know, probably already some sort of pre-programmed databases of you know, the kind of arm motions that you would need that they already showed at AI Day. They, they showed that we, we have kind of this action. And then if the box is over here, we know how to modify that. And we're going to go ahead and do that. So the parts get loaded. Um, and then it's going to realize that when the tray is empty, there's another tray underneath it. Whoop, I need to kind of bring it off. And the only thing I kind of wonder about this is that once it sort of figures out an action, does it somehow cache what it's doing and just keep on doing that again? Or is, do you think it's like every time it's almost solving the problem again and again? So it kind oh, of, does it take yeah. those solutions or, or start modifying them? So... I, I I I completely agree with you about a lot of this stuff, but I think that the way this thing is learning is a little different than than neural networks are are a different kind of beast because what it's doing and I my personal belief again the burlesque show that was this presentation mm -hmm. that didn't tell us all the details it didn't say what the fundamental architecture is, but it's clearly based on full self driving, which they're completely moving away from. There are right. there is a policy layer, right? Which is like mm. don't like steer, do things like that, stay on the right hand side of the road, etc. But the basic elements of vision and the basic elements of the control motion are pretty much entirely neural nets now in full self driving mm -hmm. beta. Mm. So it's it's a different, it's a learn by example sort of thing. And the problem that everybody talks about is that, oh, you're going to have to show it, you're going to have to do what you're saying like a million times to this robot, right? And say, like, right. do this. Do right. this, do this a million times. It's like, well, a person's never going to sit there a million times and do that. But I think that there are options to make that much, much simpler than there are. Uh, so I do want to say I, I wanted to share this just real quick here because you were we we got sidetracked from sensors, and this is not the greatest image in the world, but there mm -hmm. are definitely pads on the fingers. So I don't know if either of you think that perhaps they're sneaking in slight little resistive sensors, like as the pad is depressed. You know, it can feel a little bit of a force sensor in there on the fingertips. I, I'm, I think they're so, just non-slip tips. They're just non-slip. Okay. Interesting. I think yeah. there was one mention of yeah. a, a sensor in the hand, but I think it was more was, was it just an IMU or some kind of accelerometer that's in the wrist somewhere? I don't know if they mentioned anything about the fingertips. Oh, I didn't hear about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They, they mentioned now, of course, you know, Scott, I think is as you've you've been saying that the you've got the cables that you can clearly see coming up through the mm -hmm. uh through the yep. the actuator here that control it. And of course, like you said, you can you can sense the resistance on that and kind of get a basic sense of what it is. And and maybe they don't need sensors in the fingertips because maybe again, that's an extra part that they simply don't need. Right. But it yeah, is I, I, it is interesting that I think they're gonna they're gonna there, sense so. that the tension on that and the tension could go right back to the motor torques right so yeah it would be kind of indirect but i hadn't thought about that i mean potentially 
Yeah, I mean, could you sense some sort of resistance along there that could be? I mean, maybe they're sneaking those things in dual purpose. Why not? Yeah. You know, maybe. But yeah. then you, I yeah. wonder if you'd have to have that insulated if you're using uh, or just the overall resistance. How, that, well, you know, but that, look, that's at, look, at how, look at how simple these fingers are, though. I, yeah. I, I mean, in terms of like what's yeah. inside the fingers, they're empty. There's just the little yeah. the little cable mm -hmm. that's running up through them. So there's nothing yeah. in those. So fitting a sensor in there would not be difficult. Now, of course, the the I don't see any wiring that's wiring. coming down here. That's the information wiring to come back from it. So maybe yeah. they're just like all those fingers are just dumb. They're they're just slabs of metal that are hanging out yeah. there. Yeah. Well, and I think what uh, what Scott was alluding to as well, like uh, as far as the difference between maybe how a human would grab something and what Scott is talking about is you know we need things like uh, neurons in the tips of our fingers to sense those slight changes. But functionality wise, if you could accomplish that without those sensors, you can get it just from that change uh, in torque, kind of like what Scott is saying, and then just be able to understand from there. You don't necessarily need to add the extra hardware or complexity. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, and again, yeah. the beauty of the neural networks is that they can deal with the variability of it, that it doesn't right. always have to produce precisely the same number down to six decimal points of accuracy. <laughs> it's like, that's close enough. We're good. <laughs> you know, it's like, I've gripped yeah. it. I'm not going to crush it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> so now, John, I have to ask you yesterday, two minute uh, papers put out another video. Jeez, I haven't had a time to watch anything lately. Yeah, so what was that one <laughs> <And> about? <laughs> it was about the the Google um, the API to to the Google Mobility. Hmm. So um, they 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 have these self driving little robots, and they've connected it to GPT three, and they're able to basically put this little robot on a scavenger hunt. They type in like, we want you to go here and there, there and there. And say, so, you know, go go down this road, go past the fire hydrant, by the barn, and then, you know, take a right or come back and do this and, and look for the manhole cover. And it was really interesting that it was, you know, taking the, the text language and figuring out how to sort of navigate from that. So you weren't actually giving it any destinations. You were giving it more or less goals. Yep. And looking at that, I'm saying, wow, that's right. a lot. The same way the Optimus is going to work. The other thing I want to point out is I think your initial training of Optimus is going to have a text layer you know you might have a oh, speech yeah. layer above it but i think mm -hmm. primarily it's going to be text because you cannot trust the text to uh, or the speech to text at all <laughs> as we know on discord <laughs> right, right. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, we have one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have one, we have one user who's always on his phone, and it's always and it's being always, mistranslated. <laughs> yeah, and it's always. But funny. Yeah. there could be the option, of course, that it could either repeat it or put it across. You would have you to know, repeat it. You, you it would, would say like, would "Do you something. mean this?" Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, yes. like when you say that to Alexa, you say like, "Alexa, put eggs on my shopping list," and Alexa's go, "Oh, she didn't do it." Anyway, but <laughs> but but you know, then it'll say it'll repeat back, "I put yes. eggs on your shopping list." So so. So you if as long as you had some sort of feedback but like you're saying if it's a complicated if you're like you need to do this and this and this and this and this probably it's going to make more sense to type it's, something it's like that first but did, yeah. didn't yeah. someone say that uh there was no um voice um, there's no voice box right now yeah no voice really? box to get out yeah wow the, okay. at least for the, the the demo model i believe they took it out yeah, yeah. right yeah okay yeah, so no it neck, so it's got no neck. It's got no voice. <laughs> no this voice poor box. thing is is no voice box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, so uh, I want to get back to training, but I actually want to talk for a minute because Gary, like one of your specialty areas is 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 stride and it, like a proper biomechanics of movement, which yep. is very very interesting to me. And I would imagine that probably the knee demonstration was probably something where you were like, yes, I don't know, but anyway, or just watching him walk. Uh, and I was going to say that the, the knee yeah. was fantastic to me. The more interesting one because is uh, was the evolution of gait because uh, right. a lot of what I do, I watch people walk all day, every day, pretty much, you know, we, we do all, lots of other tasks, lots of, uh, you know, everything from jumping to something more specialty, depending on what the sport is or what the profession is, if they're a firefighter or something like that, and try and create as much of a, a context, a contextual setting in the lab as we can. Uh, but the, the evolution of gate was fascinating uh, overall, just seeing how it, it went from something really clunky that, it, you know, if I were to just overlay a human over, uh, over Optimus and watch it move around, that first version I'd be really concerned about. I'd be like, man, you're really, you're really weak in your posterior chain now. You're moving highly and efficiently. You're kind of just vaulting over each leg. And by the time you get to that final version, you can see characteristics of gait that really are, are phenomenal as far as uh, biomimicry to humans. Um, they, they've really got down that, that plantar flexion at the ankle with um, the, uh, 
downward pitch of the ankle um, was one of those things where at push off in the, the final stage of stance, we have, if you're looking at gate, there's usually a stance phase and a swing phase. Stance is when you have a foot on the ground. Swing is when you uh, have your foot in the air. Cool. That final I'm version. Gonna, I'm going to bring up. I found amazing. the video because I, I yeah. <laughs> had this up. So I think right right after this, yeah. So here we have the gate evolution. So just talk us through this because I can always replay this again. Yeah. So I want you to pay attention to the feet in this first. Well, there's a couple things because the arms aren't moving at all, which is uh, an entirely different uh, concept in itself. But the feet for the first version, look how flat they are the whole time. It's it, it's it maintains uh, parallel to the ground for every step. And you can see it kind of has to vault its leg forward in order to get uh, over its center of pressure, its center of mass as close as it can to center of pressure. And in this final version, if you really pause uh, at the end of its stance phase, what we would call like terminal stance phase, um, you can see the heel just ever so slightly come off the ground. It goes from parallel to the ground to a nice downward pitch right as it pushes off. Uh, and that little bit right there so, tells me just how much like, more efficient Like right it's there? Getting. Right there. Yep. Yeah, and, that, and yeah. that to me just says, okay, those linear actuators in the ankle are helping out that those giant hip actuators as well. Right. And uh, right. If, if we were to put it on a force plate or something like that, I would imagine you'd start to see that center of pressure travel back a little bit further than right. that first version, meaning it's generating downward and backward ground forces uh, and, and to propel itself forward at the ankle too. So it's, it's a more complete lower limb model now. Uh, I think than that first version, which most likely takes some uh, stress off the hip, uh, the hip actuators and uh, kind of distribute it across the entire lower extremity. Excellent. So, so Gary, here's a little bit of another small world story. My, my day job is actually teaching 3D animation. I, I so, saw, yeah, I get so, so excited. <laughs> part of that job, I really focus more on the technical animation aspect and rigging and all of that sort of stuff. But I do teach character animation as well. And we spend like the whole semester doing walk cycles, basically walk cycles, run yeah. cycles, climbing stair cycles, picking things up cycles. And, and it's all about how to do that. And so I yep. spend a lot of time on biomechanics and I have a big anatomy book where I bring it out and say like, this is how your muscles work and all of these things. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but watching this walk evolution, I was sitting there looking like, oh yes, I know exactly how this yeah. thing is. It's like, it's like, yep. I teach this stuff. So <laughs> It's it's so exciting uh, being able to watch it from a physiology standpoint. Like, so one of the things we do in our lab is, is prosthetic testing. Uh, one of the surgeons at our uh, facility is uh, Dr. Stonebeck, who's working on something called osseointegrated prosthetics. So it's prosthetics that can be implanted into the bone. So you know, usually there's a, a, a end of a limb and then some kind of socket that they have to cup around the socket. And the problem with that is it's really loose. It's uncomfortable. It causes skin breakdowns. It comes with a whole host of issues, right? right. Uh, and so what the surgeon does is he, he drills into the bone, whether it's the tibia or the femur, and puts a titanium rod that sticks out the end of the skin. Um, and what that does is it provides a surface to use a, a quick to attach mechanism to attach the prosthetic, um, which is great. It, it gives you something called osseoperception, where you can you can feel vibrations generated from the ground reaction force oh, into the cool. bone, and then perceive what kind of surface you're on. Which is huge as far as reducing fall risk and, and uh, you know and, and making someone maybe a little more efficient in their gait cycle. Uh, but really, the big thing is the the fall risk and balance issues that come with not having a sense of where your foot goes. Um, but one of the biggest issues we see in, in some of the prosthetics, even the top of the line carbon fiber um, feet that that people use to achieve that uh, what we call plantar dorsiflexion would be upward or downward pitch at the ankle for this. Um, right. And so leaving this uh, demo and the conversation with Scott, my, my mind was going, you know, a million miles a second. Just, and can we apply linear actuators uh, successfully to something like a prosthetic limb and, and increase that downward pitch? Because without velocity, right. the carbon fiber doesn't really bend as much and doesn't give you that, uh, that downward pitch in, uh, or upward pitch when you go to gate. Um, wow. So it's, I hadn't even thought really you know, fascinating to watch. This is the outgrowth of this technology could honestly right. be inexpensive prosthetics that actually function rather than just being more or less like, you know, the old say the, the old pirate with the peg leg or something. It's like we've got really right, fancy right. versions. We have fancy versions of that now. But right, um, right. but one other thing I wanted to bring up right here, I was still framing this because look at the energy consumption in this gate. Like yep. right now, his legs are completely bent the entire time. That is massive energy. And the reason yep. why human beings don't walk like this, if you've ever tried it, it it's you'll, tiring. you'll tire it's out exhausting. really fast. Yeah. Yep. So so <laughs> obviously they want to improve on that. And I notice he still doesn't walk. You know, it's still kind of bent knee uh, the whole time, but his legs yep. are snapping out to kind of full extension as they go. It's it's pretty cool to watch. I, yeah. I think... I, 
I, I wonder because that's been consistent across all humanoid robotics I've seen, whether it's Asimo or uh, Atlas or, and now uh, the Tesla bot. I, I do right. wonder if that's somewhat purposeful early on for, for balance and, and maintaining a lower center right. of gravity. Um, and and well, the other thing, the to, other thing again, at least at least from teaching 3D animation, Scott, you can jump in here if you want, is the potential for gimbal lock in. Uh, now, the knee mm -hmm. is only a one dimensional hinge joint. Yeah, the knees. Yeah, the, right. the knee's fine. I I don't but, see yeah. any potential areas for a gimbal lock in there. It, okay. yeah, up in the shoulder is going to be the main problem. The hip, I right. think, is okay. But yeah, there okay. is something I want to bring up that we need to correct maybe a few things that we get wrong in um, maybe one of our, a, a few past episodes okay. regarding the um, the linear drives. Mm. So it's it seems like it's only the fingers which uh, do not have the back drive capability. Mm. So it is possible right. to back drive the, the other three drives that are out there. Okay. And uh, James Dama evidently had a pretty good look at the actuators uh, at AI day and was able to look at them pretty closely. You know, uh, I met him briefly he, while he could I was actually there. I should have hung out with back. him more. Really? Yes. So he actually was able to play with the Yeah, actuators. yeah. He, he he had his hands on and able to move it. How he did he told, get a hold of those things? <laughs> he was, he, yeah, he said that the mid-sized one, the, the, the middle-sized one, is able to go end-to-end -end in 10 milliseconds. So nice. remember I said those things would be really? slow? Yeah. And it's like, Whoa, wait a minute. So right. now it, that's not the hamstring or the quad, which remember that's those are the ones that I think lift up the piano. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I mean, that would still be incredible. The, the mid-sized ones are the elbow and the ankle. And the ankles. So yeah, right. if, if you look at where they had them in there, and the, the one that's a little bit smaller, I, I think is the um is the wrist. Right. So mm. that means, okay, the elbow is going to snap really quick, but maybe more important is the ankle is going to be able to go pretty quick. And so I would think for so balance, balance right feet. there, that means those feet are going to be able to move as fast as they need. Yep. Now, I, I, I was kind of joking with them. It's, wait a minute, you have 10 milliseconds. If they're able to do that with a hamstring, <laughs> it's not walking anymore. It's running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. And, yeah. and it's it's six million dollar man kind of run. <laughs> yeah. It's able to go that fast. We can so, go faster. Yeah. We can make it stronger. <laughs> stronger. Yeah. So do you want to watch? I've actually got it queued up for when he walks because I've been walk watching the Bumble Sea walk and I can see the the I don't know, somewhere around a 10 hertz oscillation in him where he's he's going mm. like this. Mm. And you can watch him just oscillating. Uh, which mm. is just fascinating. So let me let me like share this one more okay, time here. So the actual but one. it's really fascinating to watch and to see. So what? Just watch his body up close as you see this. You'll see him as he walks. He's just slightly vibrating. So and I know that the background is not helpful. And by the way, this background. I was saying this in my video today. Well, actually, let's see. See how he's just wobbly. He's like as he walks. Oh, I can see the need for the uh, the back drive and the ankle now because they really are uh, creating a lot of side to side motion in that gait. Being able to adjust for balance through the ankle all the way up to the hip would make a lot of sense, Scott. Mm -hmm. yeah. But and and it, maybe it is a balance. Thing. And I think Did you that notice there's only one in the ankle, right, or two? There uh, isn't it the the two linear actuators and the differentials how they're creating that side to side Oops. motion. Not a yeah. Uh, I, not I, a I wonder if Bumble C has that already. Let me rewind yeah. here and see if we can get back. Yeah, you notice he's not really doing much of a toe off here. So they were saying that they were getting to the toe off, but he's pretty walking pretty flat there with yeah. his yeah, feet. flat footed. Um, but but yeah, I think you must be right about the balance thing because I notice watch when he stops before he starts to wave, he actually crouches a little bit more to create like a little bit lower center of gravity. Yeah. So I, I think he goes part see, of that see how he just... sunk, he just went eat like that. Yeah. A part of that must be just the the sheer mass of the torso. I mean, that dojo computer is no joke, right? So all of that mass is pretty much in the torso <clears> there. They need right. to get that as low as they can to the ground while making it still, you know, functionally walk so it doesn't fall over. Right. So, I mean, super impressive, but you you do notice little little bobbles and things that are going on while it's happening. But But also incredible, like the whole hip area, the way it's able to like rotate back and forth and keep its balance while it's doing those kinds of things is... Very impressive. And I, I still don't think enough people have made enough hay out of the fact that he's only got three cameras. There's there's mm -hmm. that was an cameras. odd decision. Yeah. I don't I don't know that it was odd though. I actually kind of agree with it. 
it, hmm. it, I think that maybe four would have been what I would have gone with a stereoscopic one in the front and yeah, two on the sides. Yeah. But they, I, you can see later on, they have an image where they say fish eye and left pillar, right pillar. And you can hmm. see the left pillar and the right pillar because there's like little, little cameras that are sticking out that are uh, yeah. exposed. But the middle one, I guess, is just one lens. So I, I'm curious, John, do you know how they're achieving depth with their computer vision models? With all, well, so that's the interesting vision. thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, part of what they're doing is that they're navigating using high frequency image information. So they're looking okay. at places where you go light to dark or color to color or something. And ah. They're tracking those points. And as the machine, as the robot moves through there, you're getting parallax, which, of course, is giving it it's a three dimensional right. space. And because the machine is moving relatively slowly, maybe they just decided they don't need stereoscopic need vision. It. Yeah, it'll just yeah. figure it out as it walks. And, and interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you what you can build a model over time. Do you, Do you see a need for a, a back of the head camera? I know that's been a hot topic, and we've talked about this before. <laughs> I, I, I guess not. I mean, if it's never going to yeah. do the moonwalk, then why does it need it? Like we don't right. have we don't have cameras in the back of our head. Now it right. is useful when you're driving, of course. I, yeah. I would love to have a camera in the back of my head, but I have one in the car because I can see it. You know, it's on. But yeah. but so in that case, yes, it would absolutely be needed. But if he's only walking forwards ever, then right. I don't see him needing. But a rear it, view. it it does it it absolutely doesn't. I mean. The joke was our mothers have eyes in the back of their head. <laughs> they don't, yet they seem to. And why is that? It's because they understand the world around themselves so much. Right. They know what's about to happen, even when they don't see it. Right. right. So and I would think it would be the same thing with Optimus. It's like, I've walked in here. I know what's behind me. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe I'm hearing a few things to tell if something is, is sneaking up. And You know, I'm speaking of that, they never brought up, enough. they never brought up hearing and I would yeah. hope that this thing would have a microphone in it. Uh, and I don't yeah. know that they've really implemented that. Uh, I mentioned that a long time ago, and I think Elon Musk never responded to me directly, but kind of indicated that they were going to do that eventually. But I think for Optimus, far more than for um, for the car, car, which is yeah. kind of an edge case, right? It's like you need to hear a siren or something. But in a factory, if you're hearing screeching sounds and stuff while you're doing things, that's probably a good indicator that you should mm -hmm. stop and figure out why it's screeching, you know? So I would think, right. and plus the fact people want to talk to you. So that's also an important aspect. Right. But, yeah. And imagine yeah. there would also be a, a, a command to halt or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, and even like, uh, like Scott, what you're talking about with uh, the eyes in the back of her head. Um, a lot of that is sensing vibration, right? We have a great sense of, not, you know, there's there's obviously animals that have much better sense than we do, but we, we can pick up those some small changes in vibration. Um, and there's some people that theorize even small changes in the electromagnetic field in the room around you, you know? So we have some of those other smaller sensory organs that can pick up those changes. I'd be curious how they would account for that in something like Optimus. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I wonder if just vibrations in general, you know, is Optimus yeah. going to be feeling vibrations? Yeah. Changes mm. in pressure or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's uh, even a lot of people that are deaf are able to feel vibrations right. you know, through the cranium and others. So who knows? There, there could be other re receptor sensors that they decide to have. But I I think those are down the road right now. They're trying, they are really trying to go through see how many parts we can just keep getting <laughs> just, out getting out what's right, the minimum before right. we start throwing them back in so right. probably like, ah, eventually we're going to put in there but let's see what we can get away with it first right. right and then again sometimes you know all those additional sensors the reason why they're not going to put sensors on the fingers or anything else is all of those there are crutches it's the same mm -hmm. thing you know argument with lidar everyone's like oh we're putting lidar is this going to solve our whole thing and it turns out that no, if you do that, it actually slows you down. Yep. It's it's an impediment. It act doesn't get you to the finish line quicker. Mm -hmm. It actually makes you go the wrong way. Right. So with, I think with, with really the caveat that, that like, of course, yeah. they may feel like you can get further faster, but then you you stop, you bother. Yeah, it. then you run right yeah. up against the brick wall yeah. and you you can't get through it. And so they're probably saying, let's go down and let's find out what is really fundamental about mm -hmm. having the simplest hand possible, see yeah. how much we can get away with on that. And then where do we actually need to put everything? And then yeah. you start building back uh, as necessary. But I have a right. feeling that there is so much you can probably do because they have no one has really unleashed the power of machine learning yeah. on a hand like that to go through a right. lot of things. And it, it will probably shock you on what it'll be able to do. Again, I mm -hmm. really think 
it's going to start to understand it when you when it starts knowing I have to pick up a bottle as opposed to a ball that it's going to know what is going to be the right kind of clenching forces what's the right attitude to have in hand where's the best grip point it's going to just learn that over time and over time and as it right. starts seeing yeah. these different objects it's just going to have a library of objects in there that it just knows this is how you pick it up because we know yeah. how to pick it up right. and it's not like every time we pick up a nerf ball it's the first time we ever picked up a nerf ball Right. You know, the first time we met, like, yeah. the first time we picked up an egg, we screwed it up. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> yeah, <No? yeah. laughs> and then we learned pretty quickly. Well, that's not how you pick up an egg. And then we learned to get to be right. more gentle than what you have to do. And then eventually we put that in there. And I think that's going to be the same thing is, is it's going to be training. What I wonder is that a lot of that training is going to happen way back in dojo. So yeah. it's going to be screwing up in the field and not kind of correcting right there. So I kind of wonder how the the short-term learning that when you say this is the first time you're kind of going into this particular task, will it be able to solve it and will it be able to learn it? Or is it just going to be, okay, we get some data here, send it back to, to Dojo and right. let it figure it out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good point. So and let's, I, let's, let's talk, sorry, let's talk more about oh, yeah, the, so like training, but first I think the all important question is where is his charging port? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I was looking, I was looking at the feet and oh, I don't okay. believe, cause I thought the feet would be the obvious place to put them, but I, these feet at least do not have charging ports in them as far as I can tell. So is it plugging in here or is it plugging in like when literally I just kind of imagine that Elon Musk would love to say open butthole and literally have <laughs> a little thing pop open and plug him in. That uh, would be a I, Musk I, move though if anyone <laughs> exactly, could do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's I mean at this point the logical thing would be to place it up here where you've got your battery pack like up yes. where the, yeah, you know, the think FSD so. thing is. There, but you know again it's a prototype yeah so yeah. probably it's up in the, the chest area now yeah um because it, but it, 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 depending on the current you have if you're putting it down on your feet that's that's a lot of uh a cable you have to put through there yeah that is true do we get a shot of it uh, turned around at all where we can see yes we do I, i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna move him quickly here and get him because he starts walking away from the camera so let's see and he talks and he talks and oh gosh that's just oh, a massive wire. that's a lot that's a lot of wires back there. <laughs> yeah. And back so, but there, I don't. I don't see a port necessarily. Well, though. there is. There looks like a, some sort of Ethernet jack oh, there on okay. the right. But I don't know that there's yeah. a power port. But that's definitely huh. open. So, well, back of the be. head. Thing? No, it's probably. Not yeah. Oh, idea. maybe that is. No. There's a little orange dot that I've wondered what that was. Uh, uh, maybe that, that's the the emergency stop button. <laughs> uh, do you think it is just bam? Yeah, it, it is. is. Punch it is. You in the you back of the head. Yeah. If you go backwards, you'll see it. Right. Sure. Uh, if I go backwards, like when he's walking, yeah, that thing. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So, so oh, basically, when it goes berserk, okay. that's where you have to throw the baseball. You're aiming right. for that. <laughs> that's the literal kill switch. <laughs> exactly. Right there. That's what do you do if it's attacking you from the front, though? You got to reach around. And get the yeah, you can reach around. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's going to come from behind. <laughs> so, oh, I don't know if you can see this now, but see right underneath the black part. There's a little black circle, and that's the left-hand pillar the camera. Place. Yeah, Got so it. there's one on the right too. I've watched it, and then the one in the middle you can't see because it's you know hidden behind his his black visor thingy. John, but, do you know uh, the field of view on those cameras, especially the side ones? I'd be really curious. I, I so the fisheye one I guesstimated at 140 just from okay. looking at the pictures, but I mean, that's just a guess. And then yeah. maybe, maybe 90 degrees, maybe a hundred, 110 degrees for the side ones enough that they can overlap. They, they very, yeah. very definitely overlap. And let me see if I can, while you guys talk, let me see if I can like forward to that. It's a long presentation, so it's hard to find the exact right spot. <laughs> One but, of the other things uh, I was curious about, and maybe you guys have the answer to is, um, Going back to like if if someone's walking around behind you, if the environment changes, I, I know as it walks through the factory floor, it'll have a map in its head of kind of where everything mm -hmm. is. But as that changes, I'm really curious if they get any information from you know like a, a factory source itself. You know, it's almost like a sixth sense. Can you you upload information uh, to Tesla Bot through something like factory mm -hmm. sensors or cameras? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So here you go. So there, there's your fish eye, and so oh, you can yeah. see yeah, both yeah, of the yeah, guys. Yeah. You can okay. see both, and this is where I got this from, left pillar, right pillar, fisheye. So I think there's only three cameras. Uh, there's but you can see this guy's clearly very much replicated in both, and so is this guy on the right. So we have yeah. quite a bit of repetition, and then it rectifies that, stitches them together, creates hmm. its occupancy network here. But it, So it's clearly creating 
I think so. So the car, I talked to somebody there. <laughs> I just try not to reveal names just in case they would get in trouble. But, <laughs> but in the vehicle, the car's uh, uh, occupancy network is currently 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. So it's big. Mm. I mean, yeah. so each cube in mm. the occupancy network is large, like head size, but here it's clearly much smaller than that. So it's yeah. sacrificing distance because it doesn't really need to be able to see very far away to, because you can see, look, it's it's only seeing a few meters in front of it. Yeah. But, like if you look in the background, it's got very little information about that, but it doesn't care. It only needs to know about what's right in front of it. So, yeah, but, but yeah, isn't that cool that there's, it's making a 3D world out of three cameras. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's got predator and prey together. It's got the center eyes <laughs> yeah. and it's got the ones out here. So it can tell what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, even though we're, I think we're kind of human, what centric that we feel like you have to have two eyes in front to have good stereoscopic vision, but it's actually right. got trinocular vision. So it's actually better <laughs> because they overlap with yeah. each yeah. other. Yeah. Yep. It's just that right in the middle, that's that's the weird is that where the overlap is, is where you can get the stereo. Yeah, right, right in the middle, you wouldn't have it. And that's just going to come from the fact that it's building it up over time. Right. Interesting. And, and again, the neural networks may learn that I've got a camera because I can do this. I can cover up one eye and I can still, you know, touch objects, <laughs> even yeah. though I don't have stereos because I know how big my hand is. And of course, I have mm. proprioception. I know how far away I've extended it, but yep. but you can tell because your hand gets smaller as you move it away. And so, if it knows how big its hand is through neural network training, as it reaches towards something, it's going to have a pretty decent idea of where it is. And if it has some oh. sort of proprioception sensors, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, and it may. Notice that if it just kind of wiggles its head a little bit, it can build right. the image if, if there's something wrong with the image. And let's talk well, it's about torso. that. torso. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. going to say, let's yeah. talk about that because <laughs> you two made some hay out of that one about how the fact that it doesn't have a neck is is a, a problem for it when it's trying to do some physical movement. So, yeah, take that one yeah. away. Yeah. yeah I think, uh, Scott, you had a good shot of it moving. Uh, I think it was something off the factory floor and moving it from side to right. side. Yeah. And I, yeah. Maybe John could try to bring that up while you discuss I'll do that. It, you guys keep, yeah. yeah I, I talking. mentioned that, <clears throat> that Optimus is, you know, oh, definitely go ahead, go ahead. leaning into its work and thinking that, well, you know, that's actually a really good thing because, you know, that seems more natural. A lot of times if we have to grab something, we will do the lean. Then yep. it, uh, well, I think it's leaning in maybe way more than it really should be. Yep. And it could be because it has absolutely no motion on the no neck. neck. Yep. So the only right. way it can move its head is it has to move the torso so it has to do this or it has to bend all the way forward yes and if you look at the, the video where it's able it's showing what it's trying to do where the object is it's dealing with it's always in its the center of its field of view and i don't know if that's important or not whether they want it in the center as opposed to kind of down here you know you see my hands down here that's not where you want to see my hands you want to see my hands up here right now right yeah so if you want that there, then you have to make sure the camera is aimed that way. And that might be that they're doing it and almost overcompensating and having to lean too much. Yeah. And so, yeah, the butt really gets stuck out there in order to do that. And so you may actually lose a little bit of kind of leaning capability because you're really having to get the butt out for a lot. So right um, now, now this isn't exactly right because I couldn't. I was trying to find the right one, but but this definitely shows him bending. You can see the human being. It, this is actually like, I don't know, if you were picking up something, right, you would get in trouble with OSHA for doing it this way. They're yeah, always like, why are your legs mm -hmm. straight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like yes. lift with the legs. But, but lift you with your back in a twisting motion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is a bad biomechanics, I suppose. But if it's a very yeah. light object, then certainly we would do it that way. Well, he's lifting yeah. air. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it is, it's interesting to hear Scott's uh, brought up the um, the vision aspect because when I first saw it kind of hip hinge a little bit to pick up uh, whatever the object was off the factory line at first you know from a biomechanics lens I was like yeah that's pretty good it's using the the hip mode it's using the most powerful you know muscle or actuator it has in the body which is that gluteus maximus or, or hip actuator which you can see they put a lot of power into so at first like from a from a power distribution standpoint it was like oh yeah that made a lot of sense it's using its hips but then Scott was right it's like that seems like a lot almost overkill just to look down at a small object that may not have a whole lot of mass. Um, so uh, right. it does bring up some interesting points of, you know, do you make, uh, you know, that that front camera maybe 
gimbaled in some way to look up and down rather than try and go through create mechanics of the neck and, and add complexity of in actuators. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I found a better image of this. Hold on. This will show it. And I think this was what you guys were talking about in terms of, so you can see that now, right? Because so he's, because he doesn't yeah. have a neck, yes. he can't yeah. bend his head down to look and see where the object is. So his whole yeah. body has to go down in order to pick up. Because normally I think as, as a person, I could just, I could just look down and I could see it and I could pick it up without right. having to like right. bend right. my torso. It, so, right. Yeah. And you may even walk closer to the table. Yeah. Right. Right. So it seems like right. it's almost intentionally having a very long standoff distance to pick it up. Yep. Right. Which would really and maximize that may be motors. something that you don't want to do because Whoa. now you're kind of teaching it bad behavior in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you would like it to be a little bit closer. So right. Yeah. Oh, oh, and this was the person who told me about this. So I don't I can't remember if we were recording when I talked about this, but supposedly there were actually four Optimus prototypes, not two. And right. so there were two, there was Bumble B, Bumble C, and then supposedly AI1 and AI2. And AI2 was the, the polished looking one that we had. And Bumble C was the one with all the lights that we were seeing walking around. But this guy is actually Bumble B because you can see his feet are different and, and his harness is a little different. So, so mm -hmm. he's like an even earlier prototype that they're mm -hmm. showing off this motion with. So and so, which yeah. one do you think's in the factory? You think it's Bumble B? Uh, that C? was also Bumble Bumble B. That's what that's what I was interesting. Told, okay, least. yeah, really so, okay because yeah. I can definitely see that this one's different, but the other one. Well, let's take a look because I we're think the get factory to comes up right after this. Yeah, let me fast forward a little bit here. Uh, I love seeing so, that. Hip so again, you see, uh, right? Yeah, see Isn't that, that beautiful? Field of view. Here yeah. we go. Uh, that's the one. That's the shot, Scott. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right. the shot. I mean, look at but look how beautiful that is. He's yep. twisted. His hips are kicked out. He's I mean, it's just so. I, I mean, if I was teaching animation and a student gave me that pose, I'd be like, Mwah, "That's uh, beautiful." I think <laughs> the camera. I bet the camera is already pointed down. Because if you look at mm. that, and if you look at where is he looking, right? If you put the right. eyes in the normal horizontal level, right, he is not looking at the part. It would be looking mm. out this way. But of course, but, it is a right, wide go ahead view, and actually see it's what he the sees. Field of view, yeah. It's right. I think we see what he so sees. I, I suspect they're already down a little bit. Right. Yeah. Let's see if I can get his fingers are definitely. Oh, gosh. Look oh, how yeah. Down it is. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. it's right there, right very down. down. Right. Yeah. But his head's not that far down. Yeah. No. Interesting. So, so yeah, that fish huh. eye is, is kind of point. And you can see it does look like a fish eye. Yeah. Yeah. But that is true. I mean, he's looking down, but he's kind of looking at this light bulb thing over here. Like if you yeah. look straight from where his eyes were and very, very clearly when we see him from his POV, he's so it definitely they canted the camera down. Yeah. At that point, he's yeah. looking down. You can't even see the light bulb up there, that little thing that's up there. Yeah. So, yeah, fascinating. Ah. Also, as a, as a side note, John, I love that we're uh, personifying uh, Tessabot yes, already, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a here. No, no, I love it. I think that's awesome. <laughs> it it, it kind of lends to the whole right. uh, the whole aura of it. You know, it's, it's great. <laughs> So, so do we have to we have to be politically collect, correct and call it correct. a day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have a tendency. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch that I think that this is still Bumble B because the feet are black on Bumble C, and those mm -hmm. look like silver feet down silver. there at the bottom. I know they're colored right. in kind of a, a teal color, but they definitely look very reflective. So yep. that was yep. what I was told. I was told all of the video was with Bumble B. Uh, ex except for the live walking around the stage that was bumble c so yeah but anyway that's what i got <laughs> i can't guarantee that's true but the person should know yeah. so anyway um and he told me as long as i didn't say who it was i was allowed to talk about that so i'm not saying anything that was embargoed <laughs> <laughs> but anyway i mean think about that that's four four fully functional robots in one in six year. months or something yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's absolutely crazy that they're doing that that fast <laughs> All right, so we've been dancing around training, and I have thoughts about training, and Scott has thoughts about training. Gary, like, w what do you do? Because you do a lot of motion capture. So let's actually start with yeah. you. So if you were yeah. going, to, if you were, if they, if somebody said, "Hey, Gary, we're we're hiring you to train Optimus yep. to, to do motion to pick things up properly," I don't know, whatever. What? How would you train it? Like, what would be your thought about how to do that? <laughs> Well, one of the things that got me so excited when Scott started talking about it is Scott described it to a T. And and part of yeah. that is uh, I've done I've done some work. I wouldn't call myself an expert. There, there are individuals who, who only study motor learning. 
And that's all they study is the ability to learn how to acquire skills or the ability to learn how to, how to uh, complete a task in any way for humans. Um, which is really big in things like occupational therapy. But then when you go to training, you know, healthy humans is also extremely important. How do you tell a person to do something? And, uh, you know, what's interesting, it'd be like working with a, uh, you know, a, a deaf and mute patient. We, we lose the, the language processing in any way to communicate or instruct a command. But one of the things that Scott had brought up uh, kind of instinctually from a robotics perspective, but that carries over extremely well to a physiological perspective, uh, is that idea of a, a goal-focused task training or, or um, you know, if you're a trainer or a health professional, you might look at it as internal versus external cues. Um, if I have somebody on the force plates over there and I ask them to do a, a simple task like a squat and I say, you know, hey, uh, bend your knees, flex your hips and, and, you know, do this motion, kind of describe it from an internal uh, focus point, I'll get a very different result kinematically and, and possibly even kinetically or, or likely even kinetically. Um, then if I ask them to, you know, uh, sit down in a chair and push their butt, like they're closing the drawer behind, them. if I give them an external focus and ask them to complete a goal, I get a different, uh, end result than if I tell them to do something internally. And so one of the things Scott had picked up on, uh, just from a robotics perspective is that goal oriented training and, and allowing for, um, what is basically uh, self-organization. You know, if we go to use a dynamic systems uh, approach to, to motor learning, there is an aspect of, of that motion coming from a, or being an emergent behavior as a result of constraints from the environment and from the task at hand. Uh, and, and so I right. think if I were to train a robot, I would do it the same way I would train a human. And now that we have such advanced uh, methods with neural nets and being able to inherit information, have transfer learning um, that, that can go across maybe uh, you know existing variables and say, hey, what are the, the uh, similarities between these existing variables and situations and, the, and now the new task presented to me? Being able to complete uh, that learning through an external goal would be the way I would do it. So it was really interesting to hear Scott describe that. Okay. So, but do you think you would like, so if you were training optimists, would you hook people up to a mocap system, have them do the, no, you wouldn't. Okay. No. So it would, would be, you would have it do the motions, give it a goal and then sort of grade it, I guess some, some way of giving yep. it feedback and saying, good job, right. but you put too much force into your knee and you're going to bust your joint if you do that or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Th there'd okay. be some form of, of supervised or supervision to the learning using parameters, right. most likely from just the rock kin uh, kinematics or even what Scott was getting at, which is, uh, you know, the, the voltage coming back from the motors and right. kind of look at, you know, Hey, what are the, what's the most optimal path and then kind of treat it like an right. optimization problem. Say, hey, we'll either okay. simulate it or have it actually in the lab go through a bunch of different scenarios and then record the data and then come up with some parameters that we say, hey, that's good, that's bad. We want it to be most efficient this way or, or you know, more okay. efficient in this way and then find those paths that are, are the most efficient. And, 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 and then them, yeah. efficiency could be measured in terms of time. Obviously, you don't want it to take yep. forever and walk around the whole factory to mm -hmm. move right. apart. But then also energy, energy, energy. optimization is huge. Yep. Uh, for this for as well. Yeah, especially yeah. for Tesla. Uh, because you want that 2.3 kilowatt hour battery pack to last all day, not last 15 minutes because it's doing right. crazy amounts of work with it. So, okay. Right. And again, that's probably that's why we haven't really talked about the knee, but why that knee joint was designed specifically to reduce the maximum amount of torque and force so that you didn't have to have a really, really big actuator and you were burning a right. lot of energy that you didn't need to. So cool. Right. All right, Scott, you take it away. <laughs> so how would you okay. train so Optimus if you had your 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 brothers okay well i i think what i would do is um you know a, a lot of iterations on particular motions like what they're doing already so it seems that they're learning the walking gate inside of a simulator and they've got some sort of optimization parameters that they're going through to improve the overall functionality of everything and it's moving it's marching towards some goal and um, is this a good time to kind of show <laughs> something that we've been talking about doing an episode on? Oh, tease it. Yeah, sure. Which Absolutely. is the idea, the idea of a genetic algorithm. So it's <laughs> it's not exactly optimist, but maybe it brings home kind of a, a point on how that's done. So I'll go ahead and, and, and show this. So this is something I did a few years ago. And um it's using oh, it's something so called cool, a genetic Scott. algorithm. <laughs> I know. And I love that he has these every toys time. just available. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, the idea is, is the robot is going to pick up a box from this small conveyor and bring it over to the other. So we'll just go ahead and, and let it go through. So it picks it up and brings it over. And what you <laughs> may be noticing is it's hitting this pillar that's in the way. 
And the robot right now is taking what is the easiest path for it. That, that is the one that if you actually teach a point here and another point there and ask the robot to move between it, this is the most natural one that it will do. Right. And you see, we've got a bit of a problem in there. And that means whoever is teaching this has to come up with a via point to get it around. <clears throat> and it's, it's a fairly straightforward thing. But if you sort of look at how the operator does it, I was like, well, wait a minute, rather than having them teach it, I wonder if I can come up with my own algorithm to automatically find it. And so this is what's known as collision avoidance. And there's so many approaches that have been taken out there. And, and I've taken some of the same approaches everyone else does using something called, you know, a joint space where you look at all the possible areas where you have collision or don't have collision, then you try to find a trajectory. And they just take forever and they come up with not very good results. And in terms and of hearing loss, about this in, thing. In terms of yeah. your loss function, obviously, every time it flashes yellow, that's a loss. It's like bad. Well, that's basically <laughs> that. You, yeah. it's, it's a collision. So I'll go right. ahead and, and get it to kind of <clears throat> stop when it does that next time is that it means when we're coming through, bam, you know, some, right. something is hitting and that's we just so don't cool. want that to happen. <laughs> right. So now what we want to do is you so, want to say, <laughs> let, let's go ahead and find a way. Now, there's an infinite number of trajectories I can take, which will not have a collision. The question is, which is going to be the best of, of that infinite number? And I had heard about genetic algorithms and assume that, wow, those must be really difficult things. And then when I did my research, my research took 30 minutes <laughs> and I realized, wow, they're much easier than I thought. <laughs> and I was able to get implemented. And there was like an example of Python code, which is like half a page that you can go ahead right. and, and implement it. And so I've implemented this algorithm and I spoke with John uh, with you about that about, about a month ago. Right. And you said, this is AI. I'm like, no way it's AI. It's called a genetic <laughs> algorithm. It can't yeah. be AI. And you said, no, this is actually AI. It's, so I'm like, wow, bravo. I actually did something that's AI. Then, yeah, yeah, the, AI the, it's it's the what I would call classic AI. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. so you, you break you, you break it down into a, a series of, of different strategies that you can use to be able to move. So for example, right now, it's not using any strategy. So it's bumping into things. So for the the uh, the picking right now, I'm going to have it go through what I call a a midpoint strategy, where it's going to go ahead and put a point in there, and we're going to have no accuracy. And I think that's going to go ahead and work. So if I go ahead and, and run this right now, you see in, in one way, and I and turn my stop collision off here, is taking the old fashioned way. But you see on the return, it decides mm. to drop a point in the middle here, right? Mm. And I can sort of decide how close I want to bring that in mm. or how far out. So if I change the scrunch factor to be like a hundred percent then it's going to decide to move itself in a lot closer when it does that. You see, it does something like that. But we can right. see that's a bit inefficient. Yeah. And the other thing we can put in there is that rather than, you see how sharp that point is? We don't have right. to actually go there and stop. We could do something called a flyby. So that means when we kind of go by, you see, we don't oh. stop there. We can do something right. like that. And so that means, ah, oh, I've got that strategy. And then there's like even another strategy we can use in here, which is, uh, kind of like uh, a two-point kind of strategy where when it picks it up, it pulls itself in, swings around, mm. and goes out. And there's different amounts of scrunchiness mm -hmm. and everything else you can do in there. So we parameterize the whole thing. And now it's like, wow, what's going to be the best one? And in order to optimize this thing, we've <laughs> That's got the question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The first thing, the first and most important thing is it must be collision-free. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to find the one that's collision-free. And then the second is you want to find the one that has the best cycle time. So uh, if you get a bunch of collision-free ones, the one that has the uh, the best cycle time goes to the top. And then you come over and you have this idea of these populations, and you have these elites that always go to the next round, <laughs> that if, you know, if they're the top percentage, they go to the next round. And then you can also um, do a population where you have like a, a mating population from the elites and also from others, where you just kind of take some of these different combinations and put them together and see which ones perform. And you just run it again and again and again. So right now, that was me manually doing it. If I say optimize the cycle automatically, it's now going to go through and I'm going to run this a little bit faster here so we can begin to see everything it's trying to do. Hmm. So it's coming up with an initial population here. finding all these, and then eventually it's going to start culling through them. So it gets the initial population, which I think gets pretty big. Right. <laughs> and there, okay. So now it's starting to cull it down. So it's getting rid of some of the silly ones. And you have a mutation rate in here as well. So you can decide what the mutation rate's okay. going to be, and it goes on and on and on like that. 
So I imagine this is the kind of thing that you would do for Optimus learning any kind of strategy. And it may be something you can actually build in that doesn't have to go back to Dojo to figure out. It might be something that you could do locally. Say, oh. okay, let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> and whether it actually does it in reality or does it kind of run a quick simulation in its head and then over time start saying, oh, I've discovered that this particular motion is a, is a bit more efficient. That's the one I'm going to cache and that's what I'm going to continue to use in this case. Because right. they're already doing that in the full self-driving computer. Remember when they were taking the left turn? They already are saying, let's try like five or six of them. And then they have some right. sort of parameters to right. say, this is the best one. This right. is the same thing that's going on here. So what we end up doing is that we count the number of collisions that you get. So we don't hit something and then try to find out how, what's the best way to bounce off of it. Because that's a really complicated problem. That's what slows right. everything down. Right, it's right. Like, if I have one that just is a deep gouge one and, and I'm sampling at some rate, which means every single little step I go in there and I, I get like 10 collisions passing through that thing, that's really bad versus the one that maybe has three. Oh, I just nicked it. So right. the one that has three, even though it has a collision, it's better. Right. So I right. pick that because I'm hoping that the next generation is finally going to get the one that doesn't have three, <laughs> but has zero. Right. And, right. And so you keep on running mm -hmm. it until it gets closer and closer. And usually you get something close to this. If I run this again, I'll get something similar, but it'll be a little bit right. different. And I want you to and notice no. that both both directions are different. And I'll point out the reason why. Yeah. Well, let me just point out that that it, the critical thing about genetic algorithms and a lot of AI is you're not looking for the provably optimum solution. You're mm -hmm. looking for a good enough and close to optimum good solution. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you're going to get, which is why the next simulation run you do might be just a little bit different, but it's going to look yeah. really yes. similar to what this is. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you look at this, the return is the one that's outside and that's closest right. to the ideal. So even though the straight line would appear to be the shortest distance, time-wise, the robot right. doesn't work that way. It mm -hmm. operates in something right. called joint space. And so we would rather actually swing way out here to make it a little bit faster. In order for it to kind of come in there, you are slowing it down a little bit. Uh, it's right. having to exert a little bit more power and everything else. The reason and, and, why it takes this trajectory yeah. in the way back is because when it has the box, the box becomes a source of collision. And when right. on the return, I don't have the box, so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And I would say that probably if they're doing this, and I actually am going to prove that they're doing this in just a second here because I've got video. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. <laughs> well, because okay. they presented it at AI Day. So, so, but when they're doing this, I bet that they also have another loss function, which is energy. So yeah. if this yes. thing did something that was very highly energetic, even if it was very efficient, that would take a loss. And so it would have to account for that. Right. Clearly right. for this type of and robot, I, it I doesn't think, matter. It's got all yeah. the electricity. It needs no big deal, but. But yeah, what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, we want to have the shortest time possible, right. um, but the time, but we will accept times up to a certain amount. Right. So it's not like it has to be 10 seconds. So long as it's in maybe like a 15 second cycle, that's acceptable. Right. So it doesn't mean 10 is going to be the one you're going to go for. You're going to say, well, we want the one that not only has under 15 seconds, but has the least amount of energy. Right. And it might be that it's a 15 second one, or maybe it's the 12 second one that you've been able right. to find out some way that's so energy efficient and, and able to do it in a faster time. And it doesn't collide and it doesn't have this. And right. it, the, the thing about it that I wanted to be very careful with this particular problem is when you run one of those joint space ones that's able to look at all the possibilities, what it ends up doing is it ends up taking picking up the box and deciding the best solution is the one that goes like over the top and around the back like that. And <laughs> right. you're like, no, that is just awful because you're taking the contents of the whole thing and you're just shaking them all off and everything else. Right. And so I even have one in here to say that once the box gets up there, I don't want you lifting it up really high. It has to stay horizontal and come around. So right. there are going to be all these other constraints you're going to throw at it as well to make sure it doesn't find the solution that really shocks you. It's like, well, yeah, it <laughs> yeah. didn't meet all the criteria, but this is right. one that... <laughs> yep. So I Gary, I don't know I, if you've ever seen that, but they have those genetic algorithms that work with gait with when they yeah. have like just little, and sometimes they'll end up like dragging themselves across the ground. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of horrifying when you watch the, the right. <laughs> um, but Scott, you can see that that one, uh, right before you quit, like that new Oop. GA that you had run basically produced yep. almost the same, you know, visibly, oh, yeah. visually, yeah, yeah, yeah. it looked almost yeah. the same. It was pretty much the same. It, it always gets what I look like. You know, it looks like a lip. It, it, yeah, it just, exactly. It's always yeah. going in there. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. Well, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead. And share. I wanted to share this one because this, I believe, is it looks to me like this is some sort of genetic algorithm that they were working with different possibilities for gait. And, and uh, no, for, no, for I think I think stuff. this one here was actually the dynamic modal analysis. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but how did they generate these? That's oh, the question. I, I, oh, what I'm thinking is, I I thought that what they were just going through is is looking at the vibrational modes of of the whole. Yeah, uh, you're right. Sorry. So that's actually sorry. That's a bad memory. Yeah, yes. And, and so you and think that they actually is, produced like each one of the them? The vibrations are extremely yeah. small, right? And you can't really perceive them that easily. So what they do is they scale them up so you right. can see all those different modes of vibration. Right. So just like, yep. you know, with a string, when you it's vibrating, you can barely see it. Right. But then you look at those physics classes, they always show it like this in the different modes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's still, okay, but it's still, you know, it's similar-ish in the sense that they're looking yep. at a population of possibilities and they're trying to yeah. find yep. the one that's not necessarily provably the absolute most optimal mathemat you know mathematicians do not like like this kind of stuff because they're like yeah okay that's great but it's not you can't prove it and it's like but we don't care <laughs> it's like we're yeah. engineers mm -hmm. we just have to come up good with enough close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like it doesn't have to have all the decimal points as long as it's close right. to being pi optimal. is three i don't care what <laughs> anyone says yeah <laughs> and c and c and the speed of light is c it's not an actual right. number it's just yeah. c. So there actually you go. I, I think there is a, a metric there is some metric where pi is three oh yeah oh, oh yeah that's really cool. i think it's only that it, pi it's like what is it the l2 metric Mm. Or something like oh, that. I that don't know. Yeah. That, so, that, so literally it, everything actually, else is a transcendental number. <laughs> yeah. It, okay. it's, depending on these different metrics you have, pi can take values between like three and four. And there's wow. something called, wow. I think, like the taxi cab metric. It's a lot of room. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember, but pi turns out to be not 3.14. It's it's interesting. There, there's a, <laughs> there's a PBS video out there that you should link to that that's actually a pretty good. It's an infinite very, very series cool. video on that. All um, right. Uh, that's now. That I was like, one... kind of interesting and eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. I have one question that uh, maybe both of you have some input on, but I, I'm sure with uh, Scott simulating so often, I'd be really curious to hear your answer on as well um because we're, we're watching the robotic arm in a fixed a fixed position it's in one place it's got to move an object from that fixed place to another place one of the interesting things i've found about the training for optimus is um you know a factory environment is still a little unpredictable but some of the other things they've talked about eventually are like uh you know moving optimus to something yeah, like yeah. a home environment or walking around you know outside and delivering things you know people have speculated it's just going to deliver mm -hmm. pizzas and stuff like that right but um which, which would be a, an awful shame if that was his job but how do you <laughs> uh you know use something like a genetic algorithm in a less predictable environment where there's more variabilities or things introduced that are uh you know maybe unpredictable or john yeah if you got it yeah well actually no I, i'll i'll jump in here and scott can answer too but but yeah. i wanted to talk about my take on the training yeah. <laughs> what yeah. yeah but i wanted to take about uh, because my opinion is I, I i think there's two pieces of this puzzle number one people are not giving enough credit to full self-driving because yeah. neural networks are just weights that are attached right. they're just variables there's like there could right. be millions or billions of the variables but all they are is float numbers and yeah. and and you're multiplying and adding so full self driving already gets you like 80 to 90% of the way there it's already saying this is what the world looks like i understand objects all of these kinds of things so tesla bot's got that and what that means is that when you're doing fine tuning training, you don't need nearly as much data as people are thinking awesome. that they need. You can do what's called few shot learning, right? So you only have to do it yeah. a few times and it figures it out. And I think that's what that was demonstrating. That guy reaching down and picking up the fake box was he was doing kind of a few shot learning sort of deal. But then the other piece of that is that simulation is where it's all going to happen. And you do basically simulated genetic algorithms. You throw this thing into the world it doesn't know how to walk. It doesn't have any of this right. stuff, but you give it a good loss function. You tell it what it needs to be able to do, and then it figures it out. And, and in my opinion, you can use simulation to do, go to the refrigerator, get me a Bud Light as opposed to a Dr. Pepper. Sorry, I'm not advertising these guys, whatever. But I'm saying, you know, <laughs> it has to be able to open, it has to be able to figure out what is a refrigerator, where is the refrigerator, walk right. to the refrigerator, open the refrigerator door, identify which one of the labels is the correct can, 
pick it up, don't crush it and, and destroy it. You know, all of those <laughs> tasks, but you can do that in a virtual simulated world with a genetic algorithm where the first time you have a population of a thousand and all thousand of them are just laying on the ground, like jiggling around <laughs> and not doing anything, right? But eventually one moves very slightly towards the refrigerator and it's like, yeah, you win, you know? So it's like, yeah. it's like that. So, so you can do runs like that with millions and millions of simulations to teach it these basic tasks so that when you give it a text input, Input, it knows then it knows how to break up that input by itself and it just learns it right. itself you don't have to do this point by point by point teaching which is what right. scott began this whole yeah. episode with of like drive here and then you know stop for three seconds and then turn right and go this far and you know turn left yeah. you don't and, have to be that right. and i think what you should call that is that that's what i would call dr strange mode <laughs> it's exactly what they're talking about in, in the MCU. It's like they're always going to him. He's like playing yeah. on every scenario. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, you know, like a, so it's only twenty percent probability that we're going to Doctor Optimus and the multiverse of simulation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that, that's what they're, they're looking at every potential timeline, everything that's going right. on, and then they've that's got to true. Pick one that's, that's best. Right. But what's interesting is that you know you, you talk about these different weights and probabilities, <clears> and I've sort of noticed that sometimes they can be overridden when you bring in another kind of framework. And the example is that the, the few attempts I made with trying to use speech recognition in our software that turned out to be rather hilarious was, um, I, I really don't like the fact that once I need to do something in my head, I know exactly what I, I wanna do, but it takes way too many mouse clicks to do it. Mm -hmm. And I just wish to be able to say, do this, get rid of all the menus, just do it. So like one example in our software is that we always have boxes and the boxes will always have something like box length, box width, box height. And I always want to change the property of it. So I got to go over and find the right menu. I got to click down, click, click, click. I got to type something in. And sometimes I want it in different units. So I'm going to type in the right syntax and say, I don't want it in millimeters. I want it in feet and stuff like that. And so don't I, screw I, that up I, or your, 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 your right. spacecraft will crash into Mars. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So, so I, 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 yeah, exactly. So I, I uh, built a special, uh, uh, speech recognition just using the standard. I think, you know, it was either Google or, or Sphinx that you just go out there. And I wanted to have a text string come back because I knew how to parse the text string into what I wanted. Hmm. Now, the vocabulary I had was probably <laughs> specialized, not exactly what Google was expecting to hear. So my command structure was something very simple. I took this box and I said, OK, box width, four feet. Just seems straight. You know, it was really I don't know why I picked that. I think subconsciously something in my mind was like, <laughs> that's the one you want to don't go over the length and the height go something else. <laughs> and it came back saying fox with four feet. Like, what <laughs> you know it, did i say box wrong and you know I, then i would just do everything it's like box you know whatever i could do again. <laughs> and then of course it would always come back with with rather than with so i would just right. really articulate the, the d with and still it would always come back box with four feet and, and then i realized that like, you know what's going on is in the probabilities i bet it's giving box like 95 percent probability and Fox is way down there. And it's probably got like, oh, it could be box mm. or bucks or something like that. It might be 80%. Right. So it knows as like as far as that word. And then it maybe knew width and width, but when it went through the whole grammar of a whole thing, it said, grammatically, that doesn't make any sense. It makes more sense that you're probably saying there's a fox with four feet because foxes have <laughs> right. four feet. And maybe I should have said, you know, a box with six inches and it would have all worked out. Right. But it just or or if you said that. the box width is four feet or something, then maybe it would. Yeah, have yeah. So, yeah. but I didn't want to have to say, please set the box width, and right. then it it came down to I had to end up having like a dictionary that I went in and said, this is the vocabulary of the world that I'm in, and there are <laughs> boxes in visual or foxes in visual component. All right, there are only boxes. So when you hear that, you know that's what it's going to be. And, right. and so that's what makes me think is that sometimes you have to be very careful is it may actually get something absolutely correct. And then at some higher level, get completely overridden. And then suddenly right. you end up getting a disaster because when it starts to put the whole context together, things well you know and it's, it's decided that, that sentence had a much higher probability to be correct than what was actually the correct sentence right yeah right 
Well, it's frustrating like that. I'm sure all of us who've had any kind of voice interaction with Siri or Alexa or yeah. <laughs> whatever, you know, you, you say it and you'll keep repeating it and it'll keep doing the same thing. So clearly it's decided the probability of that sentence being what you're saying is not what right. it actually is. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. because <laughs> it wasn't grammatically correct. And... Right, right. So, yeah. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So, um, I mean, we've covered quite a bit of stuff. I think the the training thing in my mind is is kind of the big open question, mostly because they didn't yeah. really talk about what they were going to do. Again, they just teased right. us a little bit, but probably multimodal. I mean, I think yeah. I think the demonstration, obviously, simulation, obviously, because they've yeah. got a, a beautiful simulator <clears throat> that they've created. <clears throat> One thing I'll throw out, this is not on my idea. This was actually Tesla Herbert's idea. I was talking to him today hmm. and he said, why doesn't Tesla sell sort of like what Meta has those glasses with the cameras? Mm. But he said, like, sell these. I mean, he I was saying, I was pointing out, I was like, look, I've got like the Tesla cyber whistle up there. I paid 50 bucks for a <laughs> hunk of for a hunk of steel that does nothing, right? I was like, Yeah, of course I'll buy it. So I was like, get sell some glasses that are like Tesla VR glasses or AR glasses, yeah. and they would have the three cameras in them. Hmm. You know, with the A pillar, B pillar, or the, sorry, the fisheye A pillar, B pillar, and um, uh, some IMUs and things like that. And people could just wear them around. And that way, Tesla's making money again. And people hmm. are wearing these. And if they can gamify it, if they can make it like AR, where you can like see some sort of thing and you win prizes for, I don't know, if Tesla needs something. They can just communicate with you like a little text thing that's like, if you go pick a beer up out of the fridge, we'll give you three gold stars or something. And hmm. and if they did that, people would pay money for it, use it, and you provide just like the massive amounts driving of data. data. Yeah, yeah, massive amounts of data. Uh, anyway, I thought that uh, again, that's not my genius. Idea, yeah, but I, I think, think it's genius. freaking yeah. genius. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like you could pay hmm. engineers six figure salaries to go around and do this, or right. you can get I do it all to day. <laughs> and pay you money and literally you can just wear the glasses all the time right you just put right. them on and you go about your daily business and the thing's just sucking in data the, all the time right. so anyway i thought that was a brilliant idea and i was like wow that's what a great <laughs> concept yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean think about it sure so anybody if, if anybody at tesla is listening and you guys decide to do that you have to give tesla herbert like a little finder's fee for like you know yeah <laughs> for coming up with the idea because it's pretty freaking brilliant so anyway um uh, cool so and John question, yeah. how, uh, how much information, cause I know we've talked about FSD a few times now, how much information do you think it will be inherited from, uh, the full self-driving, uh, data to the Tesla bot as far as, you know, that open world recognition, like you were talking about earlier, uh, everything. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think what they have now more than likely they've already forked the data at this point and they're working yeah. on Optimus specifically, but I think at right. the moment that they instantiated Optimus, he got the full, full self-driving. <laughs> right. I mean, right. probably not the controls, not the policy yeah. aspect of it, but all of the vision stuff, mm. all of the front half of everything it's doing to right. understand the world, it just would have gotten all of that. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. It, it's the same. I think, oh, geez, I can't remember. I've talked to so many people lately, but I liken it. The analogy that I have is OpenAI's GPT-3 and Dolly 2. GPT-3, they gave it multiple trillions of words off of the internet and they gave it mm -hmm. unconstrained learning. So right. consider not the full self-driving when it's driving itself, but when it's just sitting there listen, watching you drive, the billions of miles that we humans have driven in Teslas, that's all unconstrained data, right? right. It, it's not like it has instructed us to do specific things. It's like, it's just sucking in that data. So similar to GPT-3, that was a $5 million training job. It was very, very huge. It's a gigantic model. But then when they moved on to Dolly 2, which is the thing that does the drawings and the really pretty creative stuff and you do the text, that's a smaller model and they didn't have to do nearly as much training because they already mm. had GPT-3. So that yeah. was their foundational model. And then they took that and they changed it and they were able to do that much more quickly and efficiently with a lot less data. I see the exact same thing happening here with, with full self-driving and, oh gosh, I think Siri just popped up. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I see the exact same thing with full self-driving. That was unconstrained data. It's just collecting it all to now what we're getting with Optimus and with full self-driving beta, much more targeted, much more mm. limited, but they don't have to retrain it from scratch. I, I mean, awesome. if you want to use a looser analogy, it's like we go from an infant, a just born baby to like two or three years old in full yep. self-driving. And then we're, we're 
So Optimus is not starting as an infant. It's starting as a three-year-old. It already has a basic mm. understanding of physics and the world around it and all of that kind of stuff and what things are. Yeah. And it just has to learn how to walk and talk and, and do specific tasks. So right. that's where I would put it. So yeah, long answer. <laughs> no, no, that's that was yeah. perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Cool. And then um, I guess one other thing too that popped up in my head, and I know Scott and I had gone over this in uh, Ellie's podcast a little bit, but uh, any benefit to incorporating <laughs> something instead of going to, you know, controlled in the lab with uh, uh, IMUs and using uh, inverse kinematics from the Oculus set, um, using something more like pose estimation to kind of learn as it goes, you know, uh, and, and watch watch the people around it, watch the world around right. it, especially as it starts to interact with more people in the, in the factory setting. I hope it's I, – I they didn't demonstrate anything that I saw directly that could do that, but I sure hope yeah. it does. Yeah. I mean, I think pose that, in terms of learning, that's the ultimate best way to do it because right. that's just like it could follow you around all day and watch what you do and if mm. you can learn it. So that's right. where that that's where that one-shot or few-shot learning comes in really critically. Hmm. If it can learn it in like two or three or five repetitions, that's fabulous. Right. The right. problem with the problem with these things right now is it's like, oh, yeah, you have to feed it a million of these examples. It's like, well, right. I'm not going to sit there and open the fridge one million <laughs> times, I'll break the refrigerator, amongst other things. But, you know, but if you can learn it with me opening the fridge up five times, that's great. That's like fantastic. So I yeah. really hope it will be able to do things like pose estimation, uh, sort of task centric things where what it can do is watch a visual and. Yeah be able to parse out not just what you're seeing but the sequence of actions mm. like you know first he takes approximately three steps over here then he like reaches out with his right hand squeezes around the handle here pulls it oh you know that kind of thing hopefully it will be able to interpret the world so that it can just use that and then people right. don't even have to do the whole put on the glasses and pretend you're the robot and do all of yeah. that kind of stuff yeah yeah yeah, I'm wondering if it would be able to do something like uh, kinetic. Was did that with just looking at people's motion, and they they were creating a kinematic model of the person just from the right. cameras. Yeah, I wonder if Optimus would be able to do sort of the same thing, looking at a person and then create a kinematic model on top of them, and then from it say, "Oh, that's what they're doing," and yeah. then say, "Oh, this motion that they're doing." kind of fits to this thing that I already have here in my library. Right. And that's a two-handed grasp or something like that. Yeah. Or that's, well, or, or, you know, the, that's the actually kind of brilliant. I love that idea that it, it can figure out like this is the person's upper arm. This is the person's forearm. So it builds a skeleton. Like I, you yep. see that with like the, the Microsoft mm -hmm. Connect has been able to do that for years. Yeah. That yeah. it just yep, it exactly. looks at you and it draws your skeleton. So with yep. some basic knowledge, that would be really amazing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and again, you could you could fit that to a library of pre-existing poses or motions right. that already right. are named or let's say labeled, you know? Yeah. Right. So yeah. now you can start labeling the different things you're doing in your task, right down to maybe even finger movement and grip and grip position, yeah. The type of object yeah. you're picking up. Um yeah, and you don't need not? a don't need a new simulation anytime there's a new uh you know right. manufacturing <laughs> technique or something and include in the test factory, you can say, hey. This guy's already doing his job. It's a new thing we incorporated. <laughs> Watch him for a couple minutes, and then you got right. it. You yeah, know, you can step in. Yeah. <laughs> then, the, yeah. then the bot's like, "Get out of the way! I'm gonna." Yeah, <laughs> yeah let me do this. <laughs> yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> but that's I. That's again. That's just a way of making it as efficient as possible. Learning, and I, I, I don't think any of us has insider knowledge about that. But it seems like if you can make that work by far that's the most efficient thing in the world to do right I, yeah. and i'm i mean to some extent that's how humans would learn something if you've got a plumber and he's like oh this is how you use a pipe wrench to unscrew the sink underneath now it's hard to get under there and look but basically mm -hmm. the person who's the apprentice is like looking down there holding the flashlight right and they're like right. yeah you do this and then you do this and you do it right so that's how we learn it's not like we can get inside somebody else's body and like manipulate their body yeah. so, right yeah, that's, right that's, <laughs> yeah that's Hell, like even, the thing it's going to be more of a sensei that's yeah, yeah. that yeah. is there yeah. showing everything there's not going to be any ar there's not going to be any any special glasses or anything like that the only special glasses are going to be on pretty much optimus to right. be able to examine what's going on and understand it interpret it and however that's done i mean right. yeah it's, there's, there's no reason why you couldn't break it down into whatever math is sort of needed to understand what it is you're trying to do 
And, and yeah. again, go back to the no part is the best part. I mean, three cameras is mm -hmm. genius. Eight cameras is a lot of processing power. It, yeah. and, and it takes energy, right? That's a, I think the mm -hmm. full self-driving thing in the in the car is 100 watts. It, it runs like, you know, one of those old-fashioned, you know, big tungsten light bulbs that produces a lot of heat and wattage. And that's that's fine right. if you have a 75, 80 kilowatt hour battery pack. But if you've only got 2.3 kilowatt hours, you've disappeared on us again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you've only got 2.3 kilowatt hours, if you can cut that from 100 watts to 50 watts, you've just gained a lot of extra time. That's, that's right. It, you know, that's a lot of time. It can be usefully functional. Yeah. So. Cool. And that even, I mean, I'd be even more curious as well. I don't know if you guys have thought through the process of uh, uh, play at all, or just the concept of play. You know, like it's, it's a huge thing in, in human right. learning is trying to keep, uh, hmm. create a situation in which humans can right. just play, you know, play a cooperative game and, and kind of uh, be a little unrestrained and interact with another autonomous agent in, in the environment, whether it's simulated or, or in the real environment, learning from other, you know, Tesla bots in the factory. But I, I'd be really curious to see if they're running any kind of experiments in the concept of play with, with Tesla bot. You know? Right. The genetic algorithm, to some extent, if it's doing it in the simulated world, is a little bit like play. It's like, hey, try this, right. try this. It's like it's unconstrained. It's just like do this, right. and there's a goal, and you get yeah. a gold star if you if you get the goal. The thing that I would love to see by next year is just exactly what you're saying: is see two Tesla bots pick up an object together, together, and move it yeah. together. That right. coordination that is not a simple. You know, if a Tesla, right. if two Tesla bots can move a couch. From one room to another Ooh. in a house, damn. Yep. Because <laughs> that is yeah, not an easy problem. I'll buy two. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's the kind of thing where you're like, your head would just go, because yep. you've, it's one thing for it to be able to control its own space, but quite another right. for it. You have to communicate, you have to simultaneously yep. do things. It, yeah, there's a lot. That and the balance on. that kind of goes on there, because if one of them is right. starting to lose balance, then the other right. one's got to try to do something to right. compensate. And yep. the fact that, you know, who's really leading and who's following. Right. Oh, like, man, that's a, yeah. Someone's oh, kind of moving and the gosh. other one's got to kind of understand They get in that, an argument. Oh, this one's then... kind of. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me do this. It's my yeah. job. No, it's Tesla fine. bots coming yeah. to blows. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they could have a huge advantage, though, which is if they have wireless communication, they can just be. Right. It's like, I am about to take a step in three, two, one milliseconds. It's like, you know, and, 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 and so they can have. Right. incredibly so if they could get that working they could be so much better than human beings because they right. won't have that problem where there's they no don't ego know. right yeah yeah, yeah yeah it'd be completely cool think about how how we do it as humans is that it's being picked up and we can kind of feel that someone is like is nudging it and we know oh, it's time for us to go right. and the person's doing the nudging you know, it's like don't nudge too much because we don't want the person to fall <laughs> over right we want them to have an idea and this, there is like communication going through the forces between the two. Yep. Right. So we Absolutely. kind of sense that and we don't have to communicate unless right. it's like, whoa, wait a minute, I'm about to fall over. And then yeah. you kind of agree to put <laughs> right. it down. But yeah. for the most part, it, it, that could be interesting whether they're able to sort of sense that and understand it, that that might be enough communication. Right. It's yeah. just the actual physics of the body you're trying to move around and how your balance is and what you. And this, you know, the other thing is that's when you start to get the consciousness. Because oh yeah, now that's that what he's yeah. <laughs> What's the other Tesla bot exactly. experiencing right. right now? Or what would he be thinking? What's going to be the best kind of maneuver? And I want to be nice to him. I don't want to make him fall over. So I'll, yeah. I'll be gentle here. <laughs> well, think about oh gosh, who wrote the book Born to Run? It's a fantastic book, and I highly oh, man, recommend I it for anybody. Up. Have you have you read it? Because Gary, if you haven't read it, you should definitely read it. Yeah. yeah. He basically argues in the book that human beings became conscious because we are persistence hunters. And yep. so in order to persistence hunt, in other words, in order to, to jog after an animal for hours, we had to be able to communicate, but also mm -hmm. get inside the head of the animal okay. and understand yeah. what that animal was thinking. And so right. you're seeing that with full self-driving now at a proto, like a, a rudimentary level, it's doing yeah. kinematics projections. And yep. I drive by students all the time on campus and right. it's guesstimating whether they're going to walk out into the street in the crosswalk right. or mm -hmm. just standing there. That's starting to have consciousness. You're modeling other yep. things things thinking yep. in the world and that's pretty cool so you know yeah and, and i mean especially in a factory setting that's it's a co-op it's a highly cooperative yeah. environment right yeah. and so exactly. maybe it starts with two uh two tesla bots cooperating with each other through play or through a, oh, a common goal yeah. but then you have to think what if it's a human right what if he's got to pick up a couch with a human you can only afford right. one tesla bot and you got to move a couch 
How is right. he going to be able to pick up that couch with you and be able to feel <laughs> in the same way you would, right? That's cool. and that's, that's kind of an empathy aspect or, or just a prediction right. model with the, the knowledge you have of the other agent. the other. You just agent. gave me a, a horrifying, not a horrifying, like kind of a wonderful, <laughs> also horrifying thought. No, because let's say you have a thousand Tesla bots in the factory. And well, that is a little horrifying. No, no, no. But, but wait, <laughs> but wait, think about this. If they can communicate with each other and you give them unconstrained access to learning, they may figure out ways that we human beings could never figure could never out to figure do things. Out. They may yep. organize themselves like ants into some sort of crazy thing. And we're all looking at it going, what are they doing? And all of a sudden cars start popping out every minute because <laughs> yep. they figured right. out some insane three-dimensional thing where they're <laughs> all just like hanging upside down and like moving these parts. Of <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's kind of horrifying, but also amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be because remember there was that two minute paper on that. The, the, the open AI thing. thing. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. They're cooperative in that game. The, the, yep. the agents. Well, they're cooperative, yeah. but they also figured out how to cheat in the end, remember? <laughs> yeah, oh, but I mean, that's yeah. great. <laughs> they, they broke the physics. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> so what is that? What does Elon say? Physics is the law. Everything else is a recommendation. So it's like, whatever. Yep. <laughs> if you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> Wow. Oh my gosh. What a weird future that's going to be when you go into a factory. Oh, yeah. It just looks like an ant farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it already kind of if... does. I mean, when it's busy, they're like that, but it could turn into a real ant farm. Well, when oh, that yeah. ends up happening, that then they're going to start giving themselves names. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's true. Will it will they be hexagonal names? Hex, will it be X A E twelve? Will be the name of <laughs> that'll be the name of the oh, first robot. Crap. Elon yeah. Musk is at the forefront. He's already yeah, his kids he's already the started. <laughs> right, right. That was the first <laughs> Tesla bot. We just didn't know that. You didn't That's right. That <laughs> it's Tesla ba it's Tesla baby. Tesla bot. baby. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. All right. I have kept you guys on for a really long time. This has been a really fun conversation, but we probably should draw it to a close so that we can have another conversation sometime. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to know what people think in, you know, in the audience. If you're watching this, please, you know, leave comments about what you think about all this and also ideas for other things that we can talk about. It'd be really fantastic. And in the meantime, it is, wow, it's getting on towards 10 o'clock at night, East Coast time. <laughs> so I will let you guys go so you can, I don't know, go watch a movie, go to sleep or something like that. Anyway, thank you so much for being with me, both Scott and Gary. I really appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Cheers, Thanks, all. Sean.